Tonight, two men are under arrest, and we are learning more about a motive for the killing involving the DJ's alleged dealings with kilos of cocaine. Los Angeles, 1995, the Christmas season. A series of events was about to be set in motion that would cause the ghost of Christmas past to be reaching out at our friend from Detroit, Jerry Flannery, AKA Southwest T, AKA Big Meech's brother, the other half of BMF. And it all started Jam Master J. Please welcome Jam Master J. In 1992, he started a record label called JMJ Records. He had a hit with Alex, and he made some money, but he racked up a half a million dollar IRS bill. So it's December of 95, and Jam Master J has touched down in Gangland LA with Spoon, the guy who put up 30 Gs for them to get in the game, and an executive from JMJ Records. That was Jam Master J's record label that he started the guy Jay was supposed to cop from here in L.A. was nowhere to be found, but he had a backup plan. But it was a cop. The new homicide figures seem to show that life in the City of Angels has gone to hell. A record number of killings in July and August, more than 250 each month. That's eight or nine a day. Jay got to the house where he's supposed to cop. The guns came out. But no yay yo, the $30,000 was taken and he was stripped even of the jewelry he had on. Now, Schoon blamed him for that and pressed him for the money for some time. He Curtis Schoon Jackson would be the prime suspect initially, but J Master J stuck at it. And in 98, he kind of caught a break. Run DMC got a new record uh, deal from Arista and he was able to pay off his IRS tab. But of course, he had built up kind of an expensive lifestyle. He was supporting his mother, different family members around the country. He had the studio, so he still needed to be in the game, and he's floating around L.A., and at some point, it's unclear as of yet, he supposedly meets a guy he refers to as Uncle. That's what he's uh, telling his crew the guy's name is, and uh, he might have been introduced to him one night at a nightclub, of course, when you're in L.A., and of course, when you're Someone like Jam Master J and I kind of hip hop. Lots of people want to say, oh, here's Jam Master J. And these guys get friendly. And of course, pretty quickly, the conversation turns to, what do you do for a living? Well, this guy, Uncle, he's from Detroit. And uh, starts feeding Jay bricks for the low load. Now, Jay doesn't reveal this guy's name to his crew. And this is per, ah, uh, well, informant at this point statements that are in the uh the discovery of the trial but he does let slip that uncle is part of something called a black mafia family which came out of detroit and by this time is operating around the country and of course uncle turns out to be southwest t according to the prosecutor's story i think in one of those History Channel shows or something came out and a guy heard Southwest T talk. He said, oh, that's uncle. And that's how this whole thing kind of started. A call in from someone just hearing Southwest T's voice in public and putting two and two together in his head. Tonight, two men are under arrest and we are learning more about a motive for the killing involving the DJ's alleged dealings with kilos of cocaine. Uh, the prosecutors believe four guys inspired and did kill Jam Master J and it was all about Southwest T's yeah yo 10 bricks to be exact breaking details and Jay that's right Sade investigators cracked this very cold case that was revelation number one revelation number two was that Jam Master J was apparently a major cocaine trafficker and prosecutors say he was murdered when he tried to cut one of his accomplices out of a drug deal. What up, O's? Get away from uh, Bedstad Do or Die, which was already flooded with heroin and death. And when they got to Hollis, it was uh, 
low crime, really nice area, but of course that would slowly start to change as you get into the 80s. Hollis is what's nowadays referred to, I guess, as the north side, and South Jamaica is the south side. But even though his, uh, his I think his father was a mm, teacher and his mother was a social worker or vice versa, um, young Jay started doing burglaries when he was in Queens during his early teen years, and his partners were a guy named Ronnie Tenard Washington, Darren Big D Jordan, and Randy Allen, and another mysterious guy whose legal name we don't know, named Yaquim. And of course, these are the guys at the center of his homicide case in this whole BMF Baltimore movement. On October 30th, 2002, nearly 20 years ago, Mr. Jordan and Mr. Washington uh, walked into a music studio uh, in Queens where uh, Mr. Mizell and others uh, were working, essentially, uh, and hanging out. And they walked in and they murdered him in cold blood. Authorities praised Queens detectives for pursuing the case and developing fresh lead. Now, even after Jam Master Jay became world famous, these four guys stayed with him. Big D. Jordan, the father of the current trigger, uh, alleged trigger puller, was Run DMC's manager. Randy Allen was his right-hand man and his business partner all the way up till the time of his death. And Randy Allen's sister was Jam Master Jay's personal secretary. Now, as an interesting little asterisk, uh, the Hollis crew was uh, at odds with the South Side, many of whom, of course, became five percenters. And Darren Big D. Jordan, father of the current suspected trigger puller, said, quote, we made fun of them. We'd be like, hey, a la pork chop, mf -er. stuff like that creates beef. So interesting, uh, you know, the five percenters, would, some of them would go on in that particular neighborhood to become the Supreme Team. And then this other set of guys ended up now being charged with killing JMJ. So a long time in the streets. And uh, Jay got shot fleeing a robbery with these guys uh, when he was a teenager and his parents like really cracked down on him and that's when he started DJing park jams and in 1983 it's like that by Run DMC started heating up the airwaves. Initially Run DMC were just running DMC they didn't have a DJ and so they tapped on this kind of half street guy from around the area that was well known Jam Master J. And supposedly he showed up for their meeting in his black Hamburg hat, black leather jacket, and shell toe Adidas with no shoestrings in him. And Russell Simmons, uh, Reverend Run's brother, told Run and DMC to copy that style. Now, of course, Bimmy of the Supreme Team also says Run DMC kind of got their style from him and them. Go back to Hollis versus South Jamaica, North Side versus South Side. Run DMC is one of the most important musical acts really of the last 50 years so so uh whoever they got their style from it, it, it's a big date now is set for jam master j's homicide the defendant's table is going to be occupied by two people with two unindicted or maybe more unindicted co-conspirators one is tenard washington aka tink and that's one of the people jam master j grew up with, was doing burglars with Young. He was with Tink when he got shot as a teenager. And the other guy, the suspected trigger puller, who was about 40 now, but who was 18 when it happened, was Big D's son, Little Derek, who, uh, who was the suspect, uh, and just, and he was only 18 at the time of the homicide success in the street. And he fills uh, his Instagram page with photos of himself standing in front of Jam Master J's R.I.P. murals in Queens. Now I'm sure that Little D was probably held in arm with Jam Master J money and all that. And uh, I can also imagine that Jam Master J's parents, remember who moved from Bedstad to Queens to get away from trouble, keep their kids out of trouble. I bet you before the year 1980 even, his mother and father, a teacher and a social worker, told him like so many parents tell their kids, they hang with a bad crowd, their friends are gonna get them in trouble. And it's Big D's son and Tenard 
two of the no good people he was running with young that I'm sure his parents warned him, warned him about that are involved in his death. And Randy Allen, his music, uh, his partner in the music business is alleged to have run through J Master J's pockets of his corpse when he laid dead on the floor of his own studio in Hollis on Devil's Night 2002. So why is Southwest T now in 2022, almost 2023, being subpoenaed about drug deals from nearly 30 years ago? And what does BMF have to do with the unsolved homicide from 20 years ago? Now here's a quote that a confidential informant that was selling dope with Jay gave to the reporter Frank Owen. Jay gave me a, Jay made a call to uncle and then Jay called me with a phone number, he says. I went to meet some dudes at a house in St. Louis. Some guy asked me how much I thought I could move. I said 20 keys. They said, call this number when you get back so we know you made it. I walked out with 20 keys of coke just on Jay's name. That's how crazy it was. And that's the same thing other people told me about BMF at his peak. If someone who was in just introduced you like, oh, this is my guy. They'd be like, oh, you know so-and-so? How much you want? And they'd just give you fairly large amounts. I guess it wasn't a lot to them. Now, the same source said once he sold the cocaine, he either drove back to St. Louis to pay for it or BMF members came up and picked the money up. And the price was 18 a key, but if he turned the money in within 30 days, it would go down to 17. And if the money was in all 50s and 100s to save him the trouble of not just counting it, but transporting it and laundering it, it would go all the way down to 17. So if they gave him, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it would go down to 16. So 18,000 turned into 16 if you paid fast with big bills. A Brennan picked up 20 and turned the money in. Uh, the BMF contact kicked J60 just for making a phone call. So. Uh, that's the enticement that people get in these big drug deals, especially middle manning, because you can make a lot of money just, you know, making a phone call. Now, Jam Master J used his fame to protect himself, just cars and blending in with a lot of different celebrities, not just black, from Puff Daddy to Kim Kardashian and Jacob the Jeweler to Kim Kardashian's first husband, Damon Thomas, who later became an informant. And the same source of information that quoted the uh, uh, kilo prices above also said uh, once he was he was in Cincinnati with 15 bricks and he was leaving the hotel with Jam Master Jay and uh, Jay said, hold on, let me go grab my, uh, my hat, like the hat he always used to see him in and the Run DMC stuff. You never know when I might have to be Jam Master Jay. And sure enough. I think they're on their way to Milwaukee, I'm not sure, but they were driving through downtown Chicago and they got pulled over, just kind of routine. And Jam as they put on his hat and hey, you know, and the cops just asked for an autograph. Meanwhile, there's 15 kilos in the trunk. And uh, as they were driving off, he turned to his friend who's now an informant and said, quote, you never know when I'm gonna have to be Jam Master J. He was right. We start to get into the early 2000s, and it's the fall of 02. He's still working with BMF. He's not on the police radar. He appears in no federal investigations, as best we can tell. And uh, as late as September 21st, 2002, about 40 days before his his uh, untimely demise, J. Master J got a got a load. Via, uh, of bricks from St. Louis. Again, supposedly the source was Southwest T. And uh, five weeks later, J Master J was dead. And it was all because he didn't let one of those childhood friends in on this idea he had, which was BMF Baltimore. The One of his childhood friends was down in Baltimore selling dope. That's a place where people from New York are known to go and have been for years, just like DC. It's a fertile ground. And uh, Jay had managed to convince supposedly Southwest T that this was gonna be an ongoing thing. And the disputes about what was gonna go on with Jam Master Jay creating BMF Baltimore is what led 
to one of the most important hip hop icons. I mean, Tupac and Biggie, of course, might be a little more famous, but like without Jam Master J, I mean, he's there at the birth, literally. Like he's he's one of the people that took it from. Was it gonna be? Just like this fad that petered out in the mid 80s, like disco head, or go to the next level. And of course it did. And it could be that like the few kind of semi street people like Jam Master J who got involved with it early, that kind of style they added to it on top of the creative stuff, you know, made it more and more palatable. It kind of made it like Watching a gangster movie, it was the illusion of danger, and it was street enough to be exciting and enticing, but still through like, you know, kind of like a middle class lens. You choose to go out in the streets, the streets doesn't choose you, but of course, on Devil's Night of 02, the streets came right up in J. Master J's studio in the form of death the hand of one of his childhood friends. Al Prophet, BMF Baltimore, Jam Master J, American Dope.